Hi everybody, Hannah here, the Kabucha Mama. We're here on a very special Monday because it is Martin Luther King Day. And um, well, every day we should be thinking about positive messages of how we can, as a community, unite and support each other. Um, today is special in that we get to focus specifically on the messages that Dr. King shared. and. Um, the quote that I feel really resonates for me. Hi, hi, everybody who's joining. <laughs> so nice to see you here. Um, but I really want to share this quote because it, you know, kombucha for me is more than just a beverage. It's more than just a fun thing to do at home. It's more than a business. It's more than an industry. It is a lifestyle. It's a movement. It's a way of thinking about the world through the lens of microbes, um, just a different way to sort of perceive uh, what we're all doing on this planet together. And so the quote from Dr. King that I chose today that I feel really resonates with all of this is, is this one. Um, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We all share this same amazing, beautiful planet together. Uh, we share in its abundant resources. We share in the extreme diversity that creates the network, the fabric of our culture, of our planet, of our ecosystems, of our society. And kombucha is sort of a microcosm of that in action. And, you know, we're at, we've been at many crossroads throughout our existence as human beings. We've had many opportunities to make different choices. And I think we really can't go on any further without acknowledging that all human beings were alike in more ways than we're not. And we all deserve to be treated equally, to be treated safely with respect and with healthy boundaries. And that, I think this uh, pandemic and here in the United States, the current situation is showing us is how fear is being used to manipulate and divide people when all that does is, is uh, create situations that are worse for us. So, so let's think about it from like a pathogen perspective, right? Like pathogens, we know they're deadly, they're dangerous, they can harm people. However, if they were so powerful, we'd all already be dead. <laughs> and so that means by its nature, pathogens and pathogenic ideas, pathogenic policies by their nature are weak. But we have to use the vinegar of truth to break down the cell walls of these pathogens and say, this is not safe. This isn't healthy. This doesn't help create an environment in which we can all thrive, in which we all have mutual benefit. And so I truly believe that cultivating kombucha and many fermented foods at homes gives us that opportunity to really experience what it's like to nurture an organism, give it what it needs, see how that can lead it to thriving. It can help it thrive. We then can apply that same information to ourselves by consuming these fermented foods, by consuming uh, unprocessed foods, foods that come right from nature. We are able to support our organism and we can thrive. And so the more that we come together and find these ways in which there's mutual benefit, ways in which we can support each other and, and bring each other up, I think that is what's really crucial. And so I'm just glad that we get a day here in the United States to really refocus on those messages because we need to throw out our nanofibers of connection, just like our SCOBY builds this bacterial cellulose structure. These thin fibers, these connections excrete from the cell walls of all of the organisms and they start to bond together. And they create this thin skin at first called a zuplea. And this is what our SCOBY builds into. And they are also putting, you, you know, the yeast also live within this structure as well. And it's two organisms who do not share the same branches on the family tree. They come from different branches on the family tree. And in fact, humans were more closely related to yeast than bacteria. And yet 
without bacteria, none of us would be able to survive or thrive or digest our food or have an immune system, right? Like we are so dependent upon organisms we can't even see. And so the more that we honor these relationships within ourselves, within our communities, hi Aura, and within the world, like this is how we work together to build a world of mutual respect and benefit for everybody. That's what healthy boundaries creates a healthy culture. And yes, we're going to continue to see bioengineering and folks trying to game systems. And, you know, I truly believe that when we leverage Mother Nature to our benefit, when we work in harmony with the ways that she works, we're going to come up with novel solutions that don't destroy the planet, that elevate life for everybody. Um, and, and microbes are a real huge way that we're going to do this. So thanks for listening to my mini message on this subject. Um, I have a lot more thoughts about it, but I'll, I'll save those maybe for a blog post. Um, but now we'll dive into some of your questions. Thank you, everybody who sent in your questions. Um, so I sort of split them up into a couple different groups. And please feel free to ask additional questions here. Sometimes I get distracted when I see your question. It might throw me off a little, but uh, just work with me and I'll, I'll get as much info packed in here as we can. So, um, so these first questions um, are about SCOBY hotels. So the SCOBY, as I described, that's the Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. It's an acronym for the Cultivo. Um, I see tenemos amigos aquí que hablan español. Bienvenidos. Estamos muy felices que están aquí. And so we're talking about how we store the SCOBY. So as we know, kombucha is infinite abundance in action. The cultures, we give them what they need in order to thrive. They do, they reproduce. We get a new one with every batch. It's very exciting and life affirming. And it's just a reminder of, of how, how vibrant and how dynamic um, we are as human beings and as microbes. So the SCOBY hotel is literally just a jar with SCOBYs hanging out in it. That bacterial cellulose is very um, Dense. It's something that can persist for a long period of time, even if we don't feed it on a regular basis. And so um, KJ Neaton asked, my SCOBY hotel ran very low on sweet tea. Is it worth trying to revive it? So this gets to the first aspect, which is we do need to maintain our SCOBY hotel sometimes. So if you go to the kombuchacamp.com blog or check out the big book of kombucha, we have more specific details and videos on how you do that. But the reality is it's pretty stable stuff. And so it'll just kind of hang out there in stasis until you're ready to use it again. Of course, the more frequently that we give it a little sweet tea and sugar, the more vibrant it will remain. And therefore, when it's time to use those cultures to make another batch, it'll be easier to work with them. So um, in Espanol, si queremos guardar a nuestros escobis, los podemos poner en un jarro con otro líquido de um, kombucha, té fermentado. Y... Um, Mejor si a veces les podemos dar uh, sweet tea, so té glosada con azúcar, para que ellos tienen algunos uh, nutri, nutri, nutrients <laughs> para que se puedan sobrevivir y que sean más vibrantes cuando queremos uh, utilizarlos para un batch nuevo. So Rita asks, are the SCOBYs on a diet while they're in their hotel? Kind of, because we're not really feeding them that much. Now, some folks will use their hotel as the source of their starter liquid. So this is a great way to get really strong starter. Um, strong starter is what helps to prevent mold. It helps kickstart our fermentation process. And so one of the ways we can do that is um, we can drink all the kombucha we're producing in our batch brew. And then when it's time to start our new batch, go to the hotel, grab a cup of liquid out of there. It's going to be really strong. And then we want to take a little bit of that sweet tea that we're using to make the new batch and put it back into the hotel. So if you're taking out a cup of kombucha every time as your starter liquid and you're putting a cup of sweet tea back in, you're just allowing that cycle to naturally be there where they're getting a little bit of nutrition and food. You get this nice, strong kombucha vinegar, low pH, and so you can get your fermentation started quickly, know it's protected and going to be mold-free. Entonces, si les podemos utilizar nuestro hotel como un lugar donde um, podemos um, tomar nuestro líquido para la próxima batch. Y lo 
pero lo que queremos hacer es no olvidar de darle un poco más té con azúcar para que se pueda ser más vibrante. And so Neil asked, where do we store kombucha? And that's it, in our hotel. So the hotel, we typically want to store at room temperature in a cupboard. It doesn't need to be in the same ideal fermentation zone, but we don't want it to be so cold. Um, when our scobies get too cold, the yeast stop doing their job. And when they slow down, that leaves them more vulnerable to mold. And so typically in a cabinet or a cupboard or on the countertop, just out of direct sunlight, uh, but in a place where um, you can easily give them a little more sweet tea and make sure everything's going well. So los guardamos en un um, cabinet o algo cerca en la casa y entonces um, en un lugar donde se puede darle más comida cuando lo necesitas y le puede utilizar para su líquido si tú quieres. Um, so Germarita, uno, dos, tres, says, cada cuánto tiempo debe, debo alimentar a mi hotel de scoby? So this is just that same question. How often should we feed them? And as I said, you know, we can go a really long time without giving them anything. It's just when we go to use them, they may not be as vibrant. And so if, you know, once a month, once every couple of months, you're giving them some sweet tea, that's just going to help them stay more vibrant. Okay. Um, Thin scobies and scoby handling. So uh, scobies were so intrigued by them. They're absolutely fascinating. I'm going to take a sip of my elderberry. I've been drinking the water kefir lately. I let it ferment a little extra long because as a kombucha lover, I like a tangier flavor, but it's really good. Okay. Um, thin scobies and scoby handling. Does a thin scoby mean something needs to be done differently? So you may have seen that we say don't move the vessel or don't mess with it. Hi, Annalise. Um, it, when you're brewing. And that's because we don't want to disturb the formation of the scoby. What happens is every time we move a vessel or every time the layer is disturbed, that layer stops growing. And you might see the culture sink or shift, um, but a new layer always grows across the top. And so if you want a thick scoby, which again, may not necessarily be necessary, right? It's, uh, it can be an indicator of health, but not in all cases. You can have a thick scoby, but if your fingers press through it real easily, that means we have weak bacteria, weak culture. And so it isn't so much about the thickness of the scoby as much as the resilience of the scoby. And so when you pinch it, pinch your scobies, um, you don't want your fingers to be able to go all the way through. That's how you know you've got good, strong culture. So, su, cultura, su cultivo debe ser más fuerte. So, no necesitamos que son muy gruesos o algo así. Si lo queremos que son fuertes. Que si los pinch, <laughs> que nuestros dedos no se pueden fácilmente romper. And so, um, and, and, uh, Ugly scobies, how do we get smooth, creamy, uniform scoby? Well, don't move it around as much. It could also be your temperature as well as the type of tea. The darker the tea, the more tannins um, will, uh, will color the scoby so that a new layer will look creamy and white and beautiful, oftentimes undisturbed. But as soon as you start that into another batch or if you let it go a little bit longer, it's going to start to darken up. And that's because the tannins in the tea, as they're converted in the fermentation process, will color the bacterial cellulose. And so again, it's not about, you know, is it bumpy? Is it this? Is it that? It's really, is it making delicious kombucha for you? That is what is most important. So, si la kombucha tiene el, el gusto que tú quieres, um, este es lo más importante. La gruesidad no necesariamente tiene algo a ver con su salud, la salud del escobi, sino es, um, es su resiliencia. And why does the tea become murky? So Jeramita asked this question too, and it's because it's breaking down the tannins from the tea. It gets it should start to clarify over time. So when you look at the top five signs of a healthy brew on the Kombucha Camp blog, you'll see that we show how the color lightens over time. Now what happens, the murky stuff, that's the yeast. So the yeast are like these little brown wavy dudes. <laughs> um, uh, we call them yeasty beasties or yeast beards. 
they're like hanging off the edge of the SCOBY. Um, but then when they're done with their fermentation process, they're going to fall to the bottom of the jar. And when they do, they're going to create this sort of brown sludge. Now it's important that when we start or take our liquid for the next batch, especially in batch brew, we need to take it from the top where it's bacteria rich. Now it is important that the yeast get into your bottles. So we've had a lot of questions about fizz and how do we get more fizz? And that's always going to um, have to do with the yeast. And so, ¿por qué tu té, tu kombucha parece un poco oscuro? Es a causa de estas levaduras. Les llaman barbas de levadura o algo así. Um, pero al principio del proceso, la levadura se necesita oxígena, está en la arriba. Um, pero cuando está uh, terminado con su proceso, se pone en el fondo. Pero cuando necesitamos líquido para the next batch, que lo que necesitamos es líquido que es más bacteria rich, rico con bacterias, sino levaduras. And we can drink the yeast too, right? Think of brewer's yeast or, um, hi Jenny, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, applications where we might even take yeast nutritionally. And so you certainly can mm -hmm. do that with the yeast from um, your kombucha cultures. However, you don't have to. So don't, if you like get to the end and it's a little draggy and you just want to dump that out, that's perfectly fine. You want to drink that, that's fine too. You want to save it and use it to make a sourdough bread, you can do that as well. So uh, we like to think there's no part of the kombucha that goes to waste, even if it ends up down the drain. But um, the levaduras sí tienen nutrición, pero necesitamos mantener la balanza. So we are the stewards of the symbiosis we help balance the bacteria in the yeast as opposed to allow the yeast to over proliferate, which then will um, cause um, too much yeastiness, which causes too much sourness, which messes with the flavor. All right. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So how do I separate? Neil asked, Neil A. Madison asked, how do you separate the baby from the mother? Easy. So um, the, the mother is going to go into the jar. It can be doing backflips. It can swim around. Uh, it can do anything really, sink or swim. The new layer always grows across the top. So the daughter is always gonna be the one on top. Now, as the yeast create the CO2, those bubbles are gonna cause the SCOBY to float, that mother SCOBY to float underneath the daughter and they might lightly fuse. So a few strands of that bacterial cellulose may be excreted that causes them to fuse together. They're typically in a batch brew, really easy to simply use your hands and tear them apart. Um, in a continuous brew, because we're not taking the SCOBY out every time, we're disturbing the layer. Remember I said every time we disturb the layer, that layer stops growing and a new one starts. And so in a continuous brew, because we're pouring the liquid on top of the kombucha and that causes a natural stirring process and all that, it disturbs the layer, then a new part grows, you end up with many layers fused together. Um, so that really fun picture from the book where I'm holding that huge, massive SCOBY, that is a SCOBY that was in a continuous brew that got continuously disturbed and was very thick. So in that case, and you can find the instructions in the book um, or in our easy upkeep videos that come with our continuous brew packages, uh, but we demonstrate you can use scissors, you can use a knife, and we can simply cut the SCOBYs. I know that might feel weird <laughs> to some because we think of them as alive, which they are, but just like, you know, a seedling or a plant or, right, you're just simply cutting it so that you can propagate a new batch. So, si lo podemos cortar, si necesitamos, pero la mayoría del tiempo es muy fácil separar la madre de la hija porque no son muy fuertes estas uh, conexiones de la bacteria entre las dos. Es muy fácil tomar um, tijeras o, o un um, knife is the word that's missing right now for my Spanish vocabulary. I can see it. Cuchara. No, that's a fork. <laughs> In any case, lo podemos cortar si necesitamos. Oh, okay, so then someone, Cami Cam, asks, what do you think about kombuchas done with SCOBY, uh, without SCOBY, only starter tea? Um, so I think there's been some confusion, right? Like there's lots of things we can do, but it doesn't mean that's the best way to do it. So yes, we can take kombucha without a SCOBY, pour into a glass or a jar, and a new layer is likely to grow. That's just how reproductive, how active, how dynamic, how alive our culture is. 
However, the SCOBY does serve a very specific function in that it is the immune system, right? And so certainly we can grow things without an immune system and, you know, we'll still get bacterial cellulose and that's okay. But without this sort of template of the SCOBY, it's not necessarily um, able to maintain that same ideal harmony that you've created by cultivating your culture over many batches. So, so the phrase I apply here is just because you can doesn't mean you should. So yes, you can start kombucha without a scopey, but does that mean you should? There are many situations where, you know, on a commercial level, sometimes folks choose to do that, but there's a lot of reasons going into that decision. And part of it is the environment in which it's in. Most of us don't have a special room where we lock all our scobies up and they're in an incubator, so to speak, where the organisms are floating through the air. Um, most of us just have them out on our countertop. So, la mayoría de gente, ellos van a necesitar utilizar el scoby porque se, um, es su sistema de, de Inmunización. Es, es, es importante para la salud de la cultura, es importante para mantener um, la balanza ideal que tiene en su cultura. So, sí podemos hacerlo sin scoby, pero es mucho mejor si lo utilizamos. So, if you have a scoby, use it because it'll ensure that you get a better batch uh, time after time. But that, that is a great way to test your commercial kombuchas because sometimes you know, they're filtering sometimes because uh, a lot of people, if they aren't kombucha nerds, might find that yeasty stuff on the bottom a little weird. And so they want to make a, an experience that's closer to another product other folks maybe have enjoyed. And so, um, you know, growing a SCOBY from a commercial brand is a great way to test. Is this pasteurized? Is this vibrant? Is this, you know, a product that also resonates with what I'm trying to consume? And look, sometimes there's a place for a pasteurized kombucha, but it's all about making the choice that's right for you in that moment. So my shop Taj, if you're doing keto or low calorie, how much sugar should you add for a second ferment? So um, we do have a post on the website about making keto kombucha. You can go to kombuchacamp.com, just type in the word keto in the search bar and that post will pop up. We can reduce some of the initial sugar to help keep it lower carb. But I think the thing that's really key to remember here is that the sugar grams you see listed on a label of kombucha is not identical to sugar grams you see on um, a soda or an energy drink or a juice box, right? I think the thing, you know, it all says sugar, but we're not um, thinking about what type of sugar. In kombucha, the sugar is fermented meaning that it's been broken down from that disaccharide into those monosaccharide components, which means it's easier for your body to absorb those nutrients, has a lower glycemic impact, which is why kombucha, especially when it's fermented, so that more of the sugars are not present, more of the acids are present, is great for folks who have uh, sugar regulatory issues such as diabetes or um, you know things like that. Kombucha's acids also help support a healthy liver. Well, what's processing all that sugar? It's your liver. And so when your liver is functioning better, it's just doing a better job of making sure that your body is able to handle those things. So I think when we look at the sugar grams on a bottle of kombucha, we just have to think like, is this the same? It's the teaspoon of sugar that helps the medicine go down. It's not the same as you know the sugar they're putting into a soda, which has those acids that deplete your body of nutrients and are just there to please the tongue and keep you addicted to something that doesn't actually provide a nutritional benefit. So, si quieres buscar nuestra receta de hacer kombucha con menos azúcar, lo tenemos en el blog. Uh, utilice la palabra keto, K-E-T-O, K-E-T-O, para ver cómo hacerlo um, con una receta. So, Fizzy Booch, um, we get a, a lot of questions about how do we get the fizz. And I think it always is beneficial to remember that this is fizz or effervescence and not forced carbonation. So even the root word ferment comes from the word fervere, which means to boil, because when ancient man looked inside his vessel or crock, what did he see on top? Little bubbles, just like you would see when boiling water. And so there's this sort of like, there's heat that's created by fermentation. There's just a natural aliveness and dynamism from fermentation. And so all those sort of like, so we get excited by the fizz. We want the fizz, the fizz is, you know, something bubbling up inside of us that we're looking for. Um, and, uh, and so the fizz is something that captures our imagination. 
the reason I delineate fizz and effervescence from forced carbonation is forced carbonation is when we keep a liquid at a cold temperature, we infuse it with carbonic acid, and now it's going to have bubbles no matter what. So those bubbles, when they interplay with the acids and the sugars and the sodas and whatnots, give a sort of sensation and pleasure on the tongue. With kombucha being natural effervescence, the point I'm really trying to make here is that it's temperature sensitive. And so um, you might put your booch in the fridge, you go to have a drink and like there's no fizz. That's because the yeast have now suppressed their ability to make the CO2 because they're in a colder temperature. And so we can shift that by storing our kombucha at room temperature. Now, depending on your climate, that may not be safe because if it's really warm, like in the summer or you live in the tropics, you might end up with bottle bombs. And so you really have to pay attention to the other clues in your environment to figure out how best to store your kombucha. Um, so you might wanna keep it in the fridge and then just pull it out a few minutes before to warm it up. If you have the luxury and the ability to leave it at room temperature, it's winter now, uh, keeping it in like the 60s, 70s, you might find you have more fizz. Now, the other thing, as I said before, the yeast is important. And this is why um, it's so important we don't take our starter liquid from the bottom because we wanna get that yeast into our bottles. So when we take our batch brew and we turn the vessel upside down, all the yeast comes forward and it gets into our bottles. And then when it combines with either the kombucha that hasn't fully fermented all the sugar out or our flavoring agents such as ginger or our fruit pieces, which is fermentable sugar, we put all that together in our bottle, making sure we have a little bit of those brown strands in there. That is what's going to create our fizz. Now, we also need a tight cap because CO2 is a gas. I, I grew up drinking Coca-Cola, and when you left the cap off of that bottle and went to go take it, oh, it was so gross. Like, why am I drinking this? If it didn't have the fizz, it was just, bleh, throw it down the drain. Um, and so the same thing, the reason I bring that up is not because we love soda, but because if we don't have a tightly capped lid on our booch, the CO2 can dissipate, and then we might not have the fizz we're looking for. So it's that tight cap, it's that little bit of yeast, and it's having some temperature that's gonna get us the fizz we need. Now at a commercial level, because I know we have several commercial folks following, we also offer commercial consultation and um, for folks who are looking to go from home brewer to a business, of course, I'm also president and co-founder of Kombucha Brewers International, the trade association, you know, so we love helping people get from home brewer to commercial brewer because we just know that there's no way any one brand can make all the kombucha that the world needs. So uh, this is part of us coming together, sharing our knowledge so that you can have that knowledge to go out and support your community, help them experience more dynamism, vibrancy, and a healthier lifestyle. So, um, so temperature wise, if you live in a climate where it's a little too cold, and I think someone just asked about this, we have heaters. Right, so you can check out the kombucha camp heaters. Um, they're designed to uh, not use a lot of energy, to locally heat exactly what you need so you don't have to crank the heat, waste a lot of money trying to heat your entire home when all you need it on is just your brew. But that said, let me reiterate, kombucha likes a 75 to 85 with 80 being the sweet spot. So, mm -hmm. habíamos hablando sobre um, levaduras y temperatura y la diferencia entre carbonación y natural effervescence. So, las burbujas que tenemos en la kombucha, que nos amamos mucho, um, tienen algo a ver con la temperatura, lo necesitan las temperaturas ideales para las levaduras, que son más en los 60, 80 región de Fahrenheit, uh, más como uh, 23 hasta uh, 25, uh, 26, um, para centigrade, uh, so necesitamos temperatura. Necesitamos una tapa muy um, que no va a dejar estas burbujas de escapar y um, este gas que no escapa. Y también lo que necesitamos es un poco de uh, fruta o jengibre o algo y, y las levaduras en la botella para que tienen oportunidad de fermentar y hacer estas burbujas. So, lo podemos guardar en el frigo, pero lo, si lo queremos más burbujas, lo podemos um, tomarlo del frigo, déjalo un poco de tiempo, 15 minutos, 20 minutos, y las burbujas van a regresar. So, that's, that's the trick to keeping the bubbles in the bottle. Um, but that said, at a commercial level, you'll find that forced carbonation is used because 
you know, again, <laughs> we are fermentation nerds. We love kombucha. We understand that there's going to be ebbs and flows. Some batches are going to have way too much fizz. Some batches are going to be on the ceiling. Um, other batches, there's going to be no fizz at all. And we just, as fermentationists, we just work with it. But customers, consumers who are paying for your product, they may not be as flexible with that expectation. They're expecting consistency. Um, and so oftentimes commercial producers will use some forced carbonation in order to ensure there's a certain level of carbonation in every bottle to deliver that consistent um, consumer experience. So we certainly can have kombucha that's sold commercially without that, but just know it, that fermentation, you know, that fizziness may ebb and flow. And that's why some folks will um, force carbonate. And you can do it at home even with the soda stream if you want more bubbles, that's fine too. Or add some bubbly water. The thing I realized is I don't have a clock. So um, <laughs> I'm just going to keep going until these questions run out. Um, okay. Uh, how do you get consistent carbonation? Do you have knowledge on producing high ABV kombucha wine or beer? So a great place to start for that is our book, The Big Book of Kombucha. It has a recipe to start with. And you know, this hard kombucha trend is exciting to see the creativity that people are doing. And there's several ways we can do it. So the book is just a starting point. And then it's playing with different yeast types, different fermentation styles to see what works for you. But um, I think the benefit to having a hard kombucha or even making kombucha cocktails is we get a little antidote with our poison. As we know, as we're becoming aware, the foods we put in our bodies have a, a huge impact on our immunity, our health, things that are top of mind these days. And so um, switching to a healthier spirit is another way in which we can continue to make sure our bodies are, are able to thrive while also cutting a little loose. So I highly recommend kombucha cocktails. We've got great recipes on the website to make your own. And then the book has how to make your own hard kombucha. Uh, okay, so then we have a couple of questions about going commercial that also talk about some of the benefits of kombucha. So uh, the Ivan Chef asks, I have some customer concerns about Florida and kombucha. Can you tell me about it? So what I always say is, um, if you're going to have questions about fluoride and kombucha, really it's questions about fluoride and tea. I think the people who try to make the, the negative claim against kombucha that somehow there's too much fluoride in it or, or something like that, they really um, are being sold a story. Um, I know some of the folks who are posting that information and it's to their own benefit to create this kind of confusion around a healthy product. Um, the reality is the, the fluoride present in kombucha comes from the tea. Um, the fluoride in the tea comes from the soil. And those ions are different than the type of fluoride that's added to our water supply. So they're not even the same thing that we're talking about. Yes, it shares the same word, but it is not the same isotope or molecule. So the other reality is, is that kombucha breaks down a lot of uh, what could be potentially toxic because it's a fermented food. And so just like it's really great that we soak our, our nuts and seeds so that the phytic acid can be converted through that fermentation process that occurs as they sprout, um, you know, that's what they do when they make beer. They sprout the, the sugars so that, um, you know, there's a, there's a process going on of fermentation even before you get to the rest of the fermentation process. So, um, so I would say trace amounts, not really an issue. If you want to know, check your tea source. So, algunas personas teman que hay fluoride en kombucha, pero no necesitan temer. La verdad es que este fluoride se viene del té, se viene del, um, del soil, de, de, uh, de las tierras donde se crecen este té. Um, y no es algo de um, temer con kombucha, porque no hay mucho y no tiene un, uh, lo mismo propiedades de este fluoride que añadamos al, al agua. So, right, the question I saw coming up is, is kombucha probiotic? Well, friends, <laughs> there's a lot of conversation around this because there's a push to have a pharmaceuticalized definition of a probiotic, right? Um, people want to define it as something that can only create a specific effect that we have not verified is actually an effect we want, right? So the very hardline definition of probiotic is an organism that stays in your gut lining, right? And it doesn't just pass through. 
but I think we don't have enough information. We don't have enough to understand, is that valuable? You know, what we do know about uh, the human microbiome from all the research is that we need diversity. Diversity is what's key to a healthy microbiome. And so how diverse is it if we're then putting single strain or a few strains of organisms in our body? Is that actually beneficial? And does that create a beneficial effect over time? I raised the same question about probiotic infused foods. Are you reading what kind of probiotic is? Are you making sure that it's diverse, that you're not consuming the same probiotic in your popsicles, as in your yogurt, as in your potato chips, as in your, right? So I think, you know, we hear these words, we hear these terms, we want, we want these health benefits in our life um, and marketing wants to take advantage of that. And, you know, maybe these products are better for you in some ways. But I think the thing to remember is that fermented foods have what we need in food size doses, whether those are prebiotics, postbiotics, symbiotics, right? They're biotic, they're alive, they're creating a health benefit because they're alive and they're passing through your body. So even if they don't survive the stomach acid, the DNA that they're leaving behind can have a positive effect on the other organisms living in your gut. And so I think if we go to the real definition of what the roots say, probiotics are foods that confer a living health benefit to you, then absolutely kombucha is probiotic. Does it contain X, Y, or Z? Oops, <laughs> small strain that has been deemed by a certain group of folks as being probiotic. Again, I just question what is the benefit of lining your gut with one type of organism? And so I think we just need a lot more conversation, a lot more openness around it. But, you know, more than anything, it's how does it make you feel? We can know all these words, we can know all these terms, we can you know, hear about vitamin D or vitamin C, but what does those words mean? Not much until they're interacting with your body, right? And so that's the most important thing. How do you know when the kombucha is ready? This is gonna tell you. So it's all about taste, it's all about feeling that biofeedback and making sure that what you're consuming is right for you. So esta pregunta sobre kombucha y si es probiótico o no, Mi respuesta es sí, porque tiene organismos que apoye su vida, que apoye a su salud, apoye a su cuerpo. Hay muchas personas que quieren esta definición, es muy estrecha para que se pueden vender cosas, medicinas, farmacéuticos, cualquier cosa, para you know, tener un efecto más como una pastilla o una cura. Pero la verdad es que no comemos comida para curarnos, sino para darnos la energía, la, las, la nutrición para que nuestros cuerpos nos pueden curar a sí mismos. Porque tenemos esta habilidad a través de nuestro sistema de uh, immunity que podemos proteger a nuestros mismos. So, en este debate, mi pensamiento es sí, por supuesto son probióticos porque es fermentado. Y, fermentado, y cosas fermentadas tiene organismos vivos que hacen un efecto mejor en su cuerpo. So, that's, that's my thoughts on the subject. And I know um, there is no current legal definition um, at the FDA level here in the United States. And so, we'll just continue to see how it unfolds. It is frustrating, though, as a commercial producer because you want to say probiotic, and yet we've seen lawsuits about it. And so, it's just really frustrating without clear guidance um, as to how exactly we should be calling those products. But that, that's sort of um, my thought process after many years and lots of research uh, and reading up on things. So another question about health benefits is about kombucha for children and pregnant women. The short answer is yes. The more complicated answer is it depends. <laughs> so it's all about listening to your body and that biofeedback. I had friends who loved kombucha, got pregnant, couldn't stand the smell or the taste of it anymore. I had other friends who craved it and consumed it all through their pregnancy and found it was really helpful and helpful during nursing and things like that. Um, same with uh, children, right? Infants. We want to ensure that they have the healthiest life. We have immunizations and different things we might do for them to do that. I feel like um, the nutrients in uh, the probiotics in kombucha, in uh, milk kefir, 
in, in these fermented foods. And, and many cultures have fermented foods that are given to infants, whether that's fermented gruel, like we see in Africa, or um, different ferments that are considered part of nourishing a child. And so kombucha can be that. Again, it's just paying attention. How do they respond? Do they respond favorably? Do they like it? How are their bowel movements? Those are the things we need to be paying attention to, to see um, if, if, if they're receiving the benefit we're looking for. So um, in terms of scientific studies, I mean, we have thousands of years of use of people actually using them in this way. Uh, I think more studies will come out, but the thing to remember is that these are fermented foods. These are not drugs. Right. And yes, there's going to be studies of foods as well, but we simply haven't entered a point where a lot of human clinical trials are being conducted. They cost a lot of money. And unless you have a lot of money behind you because you're developing a pharmaceutical, it's going to be difficult to get this type of research done. That said, many countries um, do have great research on kombucha. And so check out research dot kombucha brewers dot org to find the kombucha research database there's articles there's scientific studies go type in keywords and you will see lots of information and studies specific to kombucha coming up there so la pregunta es que las embarazadas y los niños pueden tomar kombucha y la respuesta es sencillo sí pero hay que observar si las toman le, le ayudan o, o si las toman y no le gustan so uh, siempre Lo que estamos haciendo es fijamos cuando yo tomo esta comida o bebida o cualquier cosa, cómo responde mi cuerpo. Me siento mejor, me siento peor, me siento, estoy en el baño y, y uh, oh, estoy, um, tengo energía, yo tengo más uh, concentración o cosas así. So, siempre hay que ver cómo se impacta a su cuerpo porque su cuerpo es diferente que mi cuerpo, que diferente que el cuerpo de tu, de tu vecino, su hermano, hermana, cualquier cosa. So, siempre estamos ele, elevando para nosotros mismos qué beneficio mi organismo a ver cómo responde mi organismo. All right, we're about to wrap up here. Thank you everybody who came to watch this live. So appreciate your questions, your comments, your likes, your shares, follow. We're gonna be reposting this on YouTube and other places. So we hope that you'll come and enjoy all of this uh, content we're creating for you so that you get your questions answered so you have a deeper understanding. Um, but before we go, uh, here's a couple other questions. Um, is there a huge difference flavor-wise fermenting in stainless versus glass? That's what Cali Kombucha asked. And in my experience, no. Um, and in fact, we'll even see that commercial brands will use plastic buckets. Again, it's all about your marketing. It's about, you know, how are you representing your brand? Over time, plastic will get more brittle and break. Stainless tends to be the next material people work with. The problem with glass, it just doesn't tend to come in vessels large enough to execute at a commercial scale. So stainless steel is gonna be the equipment uh, or the, the material we see for most equipment on the commercial level. But uh, food grade plastic is also out there and used quite a lot. I think we'll need a lot more research to better understand what impact of any it has over time. Um, and we just, don't have that information and right now. Even kombuchas fermented in plastic seem to be okay. We don't typically recommend it for home brewed simply because glass at a small scale is really easy to work with. And um, yeah, someone's asking for a link, so we'll go ahead and drop some links for you. No worries. Um, so la pregunta es, ¿en qué tipo de materia es mejor para fermentar kombucha, vidrio o uh, stainless steel? Y yo he dicho que hay muchas compañías que hacen producción en, aún en plástico, pero es food grade plastic. Um, vidrio es difícil para uh, commercial scale porque es, es uh, pesado y es uh, difícil um, de, um, porque no es bastante grande para lo, <laughs> el amount de kombucha que necesitas hacer. Entonces, la mayoría del equipo, um, equipo es team, equipaje es luggage, equipment. <laughs> is going to be stainless steel. So this is what we see mostly. And I do see, can you brew kombucha and fruit juice only no added sugar? That's right, I forgot. There's a lot of people doing Whole30 right now. And the way that they can do it is uh, ferment kombucha or enjoy their kombuchas if there's fruit only. So absolutely the post you wanna look for that has that 
It keep it is a keepo. Okay, thank you. Um, the post you want to look for is the one called uh, Copycat GT. So, uh, GTs on some of his kombucha he lists kiwi juice is one of the ingredients, and so we have a version of of his recipe that uses fruit as the primary sugar source. So again, you want to use an experimental scoby, a scoby that you don't care if it survives or not to do this type of a, of an experiment, but it can yield really great results. So give it a try. So este último preguntas uh, son uh, si se pueden hacer kombucha sin azúcar, solamente con frutas y la respuesta es sí. Recomendemos que utilices un um, scoby extra de su hotel para que si hay, si no re, uh, re, reproduce, uh, no es problema. Um, y el post que tiene esta información se llama Copycat GT. So, se pueden ir a nuestro website, Kombucha Camp, Camp with a K, because we're cute and clever, um, and find all kinds of articles. Just type in a few keywords and they will pop up. We'll also um, share some links here in just a moment. But thank you, everybody, for being here today. I can only imagine I've been blathering on for at least a half an hour. Um, we appreciate your interaction, so find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Uh, check out our website. Sign up for our newsletter. That's where we're going to tell you about sales and promotions and, and all the great things we have going on at Kombucha Camp. Thanks so much for being here. I'll be back again next Monday with more uh, info for you. And in February, we're going to do a Spanish-only Instagram. I better brush up, but uh, I'm really excited to see you all here. Gracias para su participación y nos veremos de pronto. Gracias. Happy brewing and <laughs> trust your gut. <laughs>